Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of the Guitar Souls podcast. This is episode number 109.2. Don't ask. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> we had a blue screen, which was fun. There's nothing more soul destroying than having to repeat the best part of an hour of conversation. And it does feel like that, doesn't it? It feels like you're just going to repeat some of the things that you've you, that you've said, which is uh, beyond soul destroying. Um, but yeah, it's it is a good episode. It's going to be a good. I know it's going to be a good episode because we spoke about half of it already. So. Yeah, nobody else knows what we know. That's the beautiful <laughs> thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Speaking of uh, speaking of repeating yourself, um, let's let's just keep banging on about these glorious t-shirts. Look at these. Mm, How beautiful. do you feel about these? These are these are really nice. Uh, it's all smiles. Yeah. So it's only smiles. <laughs> <laughs> Um, th- these are super funny actually because literally I'm looking at my screen now and I've got a, a very notable a very notable name on the metal scene commenting and uh, sending me a message saying that he wants one of these yes um, because why wouldn't you these glorious they, they're, they're not periphery shirts are they they're, they're parody shirts because yeah we, we all saw well hopefully we all saw Misha posting up uh, the, the PlayStation shirt on, on his Instagram showing it off and I saw some of his fans getting a little bit a little bit antsy in the comments you know saying oh you know the best part about this is how much will it, it will annoy Levi Clay and Misha responded of course doesn't know who I am remember mm-hmm. um, never heard the that's why he commented yeah. on your Facebook yeah 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 um, just, and then replied to a comment specifically mentioning you yeah <laughs> don't know who you are dude but you must be upset I mean yeah yeah that really is the 2021 equivalent of you mad bro yeah <laughs> Um, so I had these these wonderful wonderful shirts because obviously this won't bother Misha. Um, but he, what the the thing that made me laugh is he he said that to one of his fans in response that uh, you know Levi's will be mad because his his post will have sold more shirts for me. It will have sold more, and I just have to take a step back and go for somebody that we have championed as somebody that's a master of business. How can you be that dense? You know, you are the the founding member of a big band and you've got a big audience and you think that there's a portion of your audience that you can't reach, but somehow me making content reached that audience for you. No, you've reached as much of your audience as you possibly can. All I did, and we can see this, if it was just one person, then it was worth the time, but it wasn't. We had several fans of Periphery, let's call them educated people, looked at the content that I was making and went, you know what, actually... He makes a good point here. This is a pretty shitty thing to do. I'm not going to support this band anymore. <laughs> well, so let's call them educated people. Yeah. <laughs> Christ. So um, yeah, you know, if you enjoy this type of content, though, you know, follow us for more trolling douchebags. That's what we're we're all about. Uh, <laughs> not even trolling douchebags. Sure. I think it's basically just holding people to account. Yes. As you put it in the, the last episode, etc. They wouldn't be happy with someone else repping their brand. So. Yeah, money with the mouth, as I suppose, isn't it? Yeah, and uh, the thing with like people messaging me and saying, like, legitimately, leave by where can I get one of those shirts?" Like, I can't, in good conscience, I can't sell this shirt because this this isn't mine logo. I didn't I didn't design this. I don't own this. The reason you want to buy this, people, is because it has this logo on that isn't mine. Mm-hmm. So the value is in something that I didn't create. So um, yeah, but I'm not going to keep beating a dead horse. We do have good news today, though. We've very good news. People spotted this on the last episode. They knew. They knew. We I don't are. Think they did. <laughs> We're bringing on a new sponsor. Um, the guys over at Rev, we have used their gear for a long time. As you know, I have this beautiful Generator 120. It's uh, got a custom faceplate on it with mine and Mike's faces on it. It says the Guitar Souls under the Rev logo. Tackle both our beards there. Yeah. So we was, do have was a... such an effort. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we, we do have a long history with those guys. And, yes. Um, yeah, those guys are, have come on board to support the podcast, which is fantastic. Like, um, it really doesn't mean a lot. Uh, money isn't exchanging hands, worth no. pointing out. like We're not being paid to plug the Rev stuff, though we are being sent a G20 and a D20, which are their lunchbox amplifiers. Um, but yeah, this isn't like buying support or anything. We've Actually, to be fair, we did have a we did run a sponsorship for them early in the podcast. Yeah, a period, quite a long time ago. Um, but... When they were generous enough to send over some uh, some pedals for us to check out. So um, That's it. Two and a half years I've been using my G3, and yeah. uh, it's still solid. It still sounds great. Yeah. Can't go wrong. That's been on the latest part of Canon recording. Your Gen 120 was on the one before that. Kind of money where your mouth is, isn't it? Yeah. Why not support the brands and try and get into tow with them? Yeah. When we know they've got, they're good people and we're going to have a good business relationship with them because we already kind of did. Yeah. So, yeah. Big thanks. Derek. Yeah. Big thanks, Kyle. Big thanks to everybody else. Um, yeah. So, uh, well, worth mentioning. I will talk about this, I'm sure, as, the, as I do the ad reel for them. But... Uh, if you're interested in checking out what they do, they make these wonderful, absolutely wonderful, high gain, uh, top of the line, big big amplifiers that are worth checking out. If you've got a few thousand bucks to spend, if you don't have quite that much to spend, you can check out the D20 and G20 lunchbox amplifiers, which have the two notes, torpedo, uh, IR load, 
things yes. in them. I do. I did it again. The same thing. Like I don't. Oh, know. you were right, and I. I can't explain them. technology. Uh, but you can use the amp and then output from the amp directly into your computer. So uh, you can use it as a way of recording. So you can get a quality tube amp tone uh, for recording, and those are great amps. They've, I think they're about twelve hundred, thirteen hundred dollars. Um, Somewhere in that region, but worth every penny. Good price. They've got so many features. Yep. Um, and they're definitely, definitely, definitely solid contenders against just about yeah. every other lunchbox Absolutely. amp out there yeah. in the same bracket. Yeah. Um, I can't wait to get a shot of mine. Yeah. The other thing you forgot, uh, you're, you're not mentioning, is the fact that it's got the IR loader and stuff. You can run the amp head XLR balanced out to the front of the house in a venue yeah. with a cab sim sure. and have it sound like you've got an onboard stage sound with a microphone in front of it. Yeah. But the stage could be silent. Yeah. I mean, really, that's incredible lots of stuff you can do with it great piece of kit and mm -hmm. if you don't have that money at your disposal you can always check out the pedals they have a line of pedals which we absolutely know are fantastic so check out their pedals they're absolutely um awesome so. i still want to try a g4 i know mm -hmm. that andy torrance yeah. had one uh i think he thought it was really saturated but in yeah. a good way i'm sure he's had the g3 as well yeah. um shout out to andy who's now got 220 watts of amplifier in his living room <laughs> you silly big sausage the uh the thing to um to point out i guess is i think i know a guy over at rev so maybe we can maybe we can score some of those pedals as well to check out <laughs> um yeah how's life how's how's life outside of outside of that yeah same pick a different sauce yeah i can't Just wait for you to tell me again keeping busy <laughs> uh, i've nothing to tell you to be honest because oh, no. uh, you know everything um, actually there was something i was going to mention that i sure. didn't uh before i've decided i'm going to take on a small project um it'll be building something Okay. But I'm not telling you what. Right, okay. And uh, you'll get to play with the prototype, okay. should it happen. Um, nothing fancy, nothing revolutionary, yeah. revolutionary, nothing groundbreaking. But if it pays off, it might be quite a cool thing. Okay. So, so we'll, uh, we'll see what happens. Cool. Uh, I might even film the process so that I can put it up and see what people think. Um, I am not the originator of this idea. I saw a couple of videos on it from YouTube, funnily enough, okay. and thought, well, you know what? I think that'll be a fun wee thing to do. It's sure. cheap enough. It's easy. Um, and it should be interesting. Cool. So uh, without giving you any more information, it's music related. Sweet. Yeah. I um I legitimately have no idea what he's talking about. So I, I legitimately because I'm yeah. not telling you anything. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. All right. I like to hear that. That's um sweet. Sweet. I'm just trying to think if anything's happened in my life, but obviously not. Just working and annoying people on the internet. It's um yeah. It's a, it's a busy life. All uh, working, no piano makes Levi a dull boy. That's a good point. Um, oh, actually, no, we do, there is something that, that I have been doing this week. We had a meeting with uh, with the artist that is going to be doing the new intro for Correct. the podcast. We talked about this before, mentioned that we were going to do this. Uh, yeah, we got these grand ideas of how, how we wanted it to look and what we wanted it to be. And we've had a meeting with the with the person doing it. And it's going to it's going to cost us a lot more than we had initially anticipated. In fact, it's going to cost us more than the podcast has made in its life um, in terms of actual real life money. But uh, we're okay with that. Like, absolutely. Yeah. You know the, the concept of the black dollar, the idea of keeping it within black communities. Right. You yeah. heard this before? Yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 Buying black products, looking after yeah. uh, local stores and whatever. Yeah. Kind of like that, but it's just more the talking about looking after local independent businesses. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't grudge the price yeah, that we're yeah. going to pay. I think it's going to be totally worth it. Yeah. And it's also an opportunity for those of you who love the podcast. Yes. To have yourself immortalised into the lore of the guitar souls because Levi and I were thinking, and as he previously announced when we recorded the first version of this, <laughs> uh, which has now gone to the corrupted ether, yeah. the, the great uh, data dump in the sky, <laughs> that uh, we would like to run a separate campaign with a limited edition t-shirt, which of its own variety it should definitely sell don't worry it's not the pro piracy one i mean uh, this would sell <laughs> i know it would. i mean it would again we've got somebody who's a very uh well-known name yeah uh, who wants to to get one off us yeah. um but i so the idea is we're going to have a limited edition t-shirt and within or maybe a limited period t-shirt within a certain period of time if you buy one the money for that is going to go towards helping pay for the costs of the video and in return as a small thank you we're going to have people's names in there as donators because you'll have helped make that become yeah. something we could do but not as a scrolling credits or anything like that like no. we've got a way to work them into the actual design that we've got for the for the yes. video so it's very nice you guys are absolutely going to love it we've already got one name on there haven't we we do have yeah one name yeah, yeah. 
the man yeah. who has somehow single hand single handedly basically funded us yeah, yeah. for the last couple of months. Big thanks to Chris Lock as, yes, as usual. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Too kind. Yeah. Um and Chris, of course, is a supporter over on buymeacoffee.com. Link in the description. Great way to support the show. Mm-hmm. We need to do another bonus episode at some point after the coming week. I forgot about that. Fantastic. Well, I'm working most of the week, but I'm sure we'll watch something yeah, we'll, out. We'll find out a way to, to make it work. We might be late with it. We're always fucking... We're, we're useless and late, but sometimes these things happen. That's fine. I'm just useless. <laughs> yeah. Um, Time so, does not exist for me. So shall we Shall we move on? Shall we, shall Let's we do, do it. Stuff? Well, first, allow me to tell you something. Did you know? This show is brought to you by our friends over at Ormsby Guitars, and I want to let you guys know that now is the time to get involved on their upcoming Run 16 guitars. Now, there's some incredible guitars here available for your money, starting as low as $1,400. That is an incredible price for some cutting-edge guitar technology. Starting up first, we have the Run 16 Hype GTRs, available in a variety of colours, 6, 7 and 8 string models. You can also get your hands on a Metal X, again in a variety of colours and different string variations. You can also purchase the Metal V Headless, which is my choice of the bunch. Absolutely stunning, especially in that Dragon Burst. Absolutely beautiful instrument, super cool. Imagine that in an 8 string, you know you want it. And then finally, we have the Hype 6 GTR Ando San Signature Model. Again, another Hype GTR available in 6, 7 and 8 string models. This show is also brought to you by our friends over at Rev Amplification, a one-stop shop for all the best tones that you could ever desire. Head on over to Rev's website to check out their incredible range of lunchbox amplifiers, the D20 and G20. Both 20 watt lunchbox amplifiers equipped with two notes, torpedo embedded reactive load and virtual cabinets so you can both play live and record direct into your home recording system. All that tube tone with none of the hassle. If you're looking for all of that classic Rev tone, but on a budget, then check out their pedal series. The G2, G3, and G4 pedals will give you the classic Rev Generator 120 amp tones, but in a stomp box. I use one of these myself on a regular basis, and the tone is astonishing. Alternatively, you can head on over to their amplifier section and check out the Generator 120, the big daddy of amplifiers. You may notice one in the back of these Guitar Souls videos. You will get no better tone in a big monster amp than this. Thanks very much to the guys at Rev. On with the show. So as always, a huge thanks to our friends and family over at Ormsby Guitars. Those guys are absolutely awesome. We've got a couple on the wall here. Uh, we have seen that a couple of you guys have been ordering some of the Run 16s, most notably the uh, the Headless Vs, which are definitely the winners. Definitely the winners. Oh, right. they're so up there, man. <laughs> I absolutely would love one. Yeah. Um, also, for anyone who has been asking and has been uh, put off by the fact that there isn't really a lot of orders for left-handed guitars, Perry put it out that had they got 20 for the Run 16, that they would go ahead and they would offer some spares as well, I believe. Um, we managed, I keep saying we, they managed to hit that 20, which is fantastic because I think there's probably a lot of people who are left-handed that maybe haven't had the opportunity to foray into the, the Ormsby side. They've only really done one or two runs before, I think, that were left-handed. Yeah. Um, same reason for the bases. So many offers of, I would love one of these, I want it, I, want it, I would order it. We had a pre-order and then the pre-orders go up and it's... Yeah, and that could be for any reason. That could be people are having a hard time, just wrong timing. Could be they don't like the shape, the finishes, whatever. But yeah. it's nice to see that there's lefties out happened. there. Yeah, so, so I'm excited for those. If uh, you are a freak, you can get a guitar that suits your needs. <laughs> <laughs> That's not very fair for me to say because I know that I'm an absolute freak. Yeah, no, that is that is fair. <laughs> anyway, let's move on to White Boy Summer. Well, I, I just want to add an, uh, an additional um, oh, sorry. thing there, which is we said, as usual, a, a thanks to a fr- to our friends and family mm-hmm. over at Ormsby Guitars. But, but now, moving forward, we'll have to start saying, and also a big thank you to our friends over at Rev Amplification. Absolutely. So, as usual, as usual. Please do go and check out Rev Amplification. We're going to move on to some fan mail. We've got a yes. couple of simple bits of fan mail to read through. As always, send us fan mail to gsoulsfanmail at gmail.com. Get involved in the show. It really does make the show worthwhile. Uh, it makes me really love and enjoy the show. So please do send us some fan mail. Yes. Uh, let's read Matt's fan mail again. Exactly. <laughs> you see again, they've not heard it. True. So that, True. I, well, I'm getting deja vu, but you'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> so hello, lads. Matthew Dowie from Belfast here again. Hello, Matt. I'm reading this for like the third time now, mate, just in case you think I'm... Been a bit confident about reading it. <laughs> I hope you're both well. I'm enjoying tuning into the podcast every week. Always gives me a good laugh. And we all need a bit of that these days. I could not agree more, buddy. Could not agree more. And thank you for the kind words. I'm just writing to say I've recently done an Ancestry DNA test and it turns out I'm 72% Scottish and 28% Irish. 
Not really a surprise given the history of Northern Ireland. This proves I'm basically Scottish. Can Mike give me any tips for how I can embrace my Scottish heritage? Levi, as an adopted Scotsman, you could maybe give some advice too. I wonder if this is possible without it involving getting absolutely wanker drunk. All the best, lads. Matt. Get wanker drunk. Next fan mail. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite as simple as that. Um, immerse yourself in Scottish comedy. That is probably the best way. And that's older comedy as well as the most or the more modern stuff. Billy Conley, um, Scotch and Rye, uh, all the way up to uh, Chewing the Fat and then up to Still Game and Burniston and Lemmy Show and Pity Party. Like There is a lot of good Scottish comedy out there. Scott Squad. Um, I like all of that, but I love Still Game. Uh, Still Game, is, it, it was its own. Yeah. I mean, how Not much the Chewing last the Fat have you seen? A uh, fair amount. Did you prefer Still Game? Yeah. I get you. Yeah. I think Still Game, the first first four or five seasons at yeah. least yeah. were magical they were yeah. just such a a different view on even any sort of kind of daft uh, like comedy or a try like a fucking I can't think sitcom yeah. that, that's the word I was looking for sitcom because it's not very often you see it being played by like two pensioners who are yeah. from like the poorer working class yeah. parts of somewhere. Mm. So it's really interesting. It kind of echoes Rab C to me. Yes. Another one to go and check out Rab C is, but that's some uh, ridiculous comedy, yeah. especially considering the, uh, what do you call him, Gregor, is it Gregor Foster? I can't remember. No, it's not Gregor Foster. The chap that played him oh. absolutely hates the fact that he played the role. And that's because <laughs> he'd done it so well that people just associate him with that. Sure. Um, so, aye, there's yeah, plenty probably. out there, that's what I would say. Um, that and mince and tatties, uh, or black pudding, black pudding, or haggis. If you're going for black pudding, it has to be stored away. Uh, mince and tatties, you'll be all right with anything. Just make sure you've got uh, plenty of onions in your onion gravy. Um, <laughs> top tip, personal top tip, you buy some Gold Star, if you can get it, brown sauce, which is like chippy brown sauce with lots yep. of vinegar through it, and you make sure you lather that through your mince. Absolutely, it spices it up, fruits it up. Oh, I am... Um... Oh. I, I'm going. Well, I was going to say I'm going super working class with the food that I was enjoying, but but actually mince and tatties is pretty. That's about as working class. Just as, as you get. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, no. My magic lunch yesterday is a uh, scotch pie, scotch pie, beans, right. scotch pie with beans on top, mm-hmm. lots of black pepper. Where did you get the scotch pie for? Just a Bell's one. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. aye, Bell's pies are good. Yeah. But, but what... I mean, good for a bad pie. Yeah, so oh, they're not a bad pies, pie. They're still not. It's still. It's not like a Kilmarnock pie, which is. Fuck a ch- off! A cheaper Wait, steak pie. Don't don't start saying <laughs> Kelly pies are good in North Lanarkshire, right? We've got Denham's Bakers in the corner. Yeah. Their pies, I think they must put double cream or something through them, and they are the, like the the ultimate sin food. Yeah. I used to get a pie rab for there. You understand what a pie rab is? I, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm. We've talked about pie rabs on the mm-hmm. on the podcast because it comes up in the in the chat, and sure people are laughing about the. It's, it's happened again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> pie roll and butter. Yeah. <laughs> a piece and pie, basically. I have That's friends... a Scottish thing, by the way, a piece. Aye, a piece yeah. is a sandwich. Yeah. Uh, you can't fling Julie pieces. Oh, you can't fling pieces out a seven-story flat. 700 hungry beans will testify to that. You know, I heard that song before, no? <laughs> with its butter, breeder, chili, with our pieces, plain our pan. Uh, can't remember the rest of it. It's a song about no throwing your sandwiches out of the flats. Um, two kids <laughs> I, I don't know why but that's, that's a Scottish song fantastic uh, I, um, oh, oh Denham's Bakers man like they, they do some unbelievable pies yeah. but I've got a friend who has experimented with things put on a buttered well-fired roll including a slice of pizza and a pot noodle I'm not crazy on a well-fired roll not crazy on a well-fired roll yeah. I feel like I should bring you a well-fired like roll you don't like haggis you don't like well-fired rolls well funnily enough I'm also not Scottish <laughs> You're a prick. Well, I'll, I'll give not you because that. you're not Scottish, but just in general, <laughs> I'll totally give you that. That's part of your uh, your charm. Yeah. One of those wee idiosyncrasies about you that we yeah. all love. Yeah, and I take uh, I take issue with the usage of the word pie because you're using the word pie correctly here when you talk about like a pie rab. It's a an actual pie. Mm-hmm. Whereas we also up here, our steak pies are not pies at all. They're steak stews with a bit of pastry along the top. If there's not pastry all around the thing. To me, it's not a fucking pie. Stop calling it a pie. I love a steak pie, a Scottish steak pie. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's also not a pie. It's just a totally different... It's glorious. Do you know what famous uh, Wish was most famous for? The biggest E. coli outbreak in all of Europe <laughs> for one single source. 
and it was a steak pie <laughs> that was delivered to a church that didn't cook it properly. <laughs> and the butchers got shut down for it because okay. it was like 20 people died. Wow. It's pretty bad. Pretty bad. Wow. Uh, and maybe that, if they put pastry around that pie. <laughs> John bars the butchers, I believe. Yeah. Um, no, it's not to do with the pastry. It was the fact that the whoever it was that cooked it as part of the clergy or whatever clearly didn't cook it long enough yeah. and allowed everyone to die. Too busy pumping kids. So, sh- uh, I'd maybe take that one back for Christ's sake. Um, <laughs> I take nothing back. I apologise for nothing. I know, that's true. Uh, Pyrab, fantastic. Are you not going to give your advice to Matt? Well, my, you... Uh, You're just going to copy me? Well, to... I see what you've done. He knows exactly what he's done here. He gave half of my answers as well there. So I would say still game and black pudding. Mm. Um, black pudding's not that popular in English or, or blood sausage, uh, but it's fantastic. You do get it in England from time to time. Don't know mm-hmm. if it's all that popular in Northern Ireland, but again, there's a lot of Scottish people in Northern Ireland, so it's entirely possible. Yeah. Uh, but if you are outside of the, the region, if you are listening to the podcast from America, get your hands on some good black sausage. Black sausage? Black pudding. Um, I love a bit of black pudding. Black pudding's yeah. fantastic. Stornoway black pudding is different world. Yeah. When Nancy and I went to Stornoway a few years ago, I'll just tell this one really quickly, we brought some back with us. You can get it in like um, Costco and stuff, so it's not as if it's un- uncommon. And right. uh, quite a lot of independent butchers stock it because it's so highly regarded. Yeah. But we made our own black pudding pakora, and then Nancy made this homemade like mint ratia to go with it. Oh my God, it was so good. Pakora's a very Scottish thing as well. Yeah. Yeah, there's quite a lot of uh, Indian dishes that seem to have supposedly been born of, of Scotland. Yeah. The tikka masala yeah. is apparently a Scottish thing. Yeah. Um, invented not far from here. Hamilton was the, or uh, Glasgow, one of the two. It's like a kind of yeah. cultural home for it. Well, I, I see it, people saying Glasgow, but to be fair, that's prob- it's entirely possible that it's Hamilton. But as you zoom further and further away from the Scotland area, Glasgow. Hamilton just becomes Glasgow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I, I might be confusing that with the fact that there used to be a takeaway in Hamilton that did a buckfast curry. <laughs> it might have been a buckfast tikka masala. They're constantly trying to do new things. I mean, the chasney's relatively popular up here, and I can't get it. I can't get on board with it. Do you like a chasney? No, no, thank you. You kidding on? Well, have you the chasney hoagie? I have. Yeah, and you didn't like it. I mean, there are just You're other things savage. I'd rather put on. A bit, and people are going to be mortified when I say this. My favourite pizza now is a chicken korma pizza. And you're going to say korma? Absolutely magic. I'm not going to lie. See if you get a good korma. Yeah, fantastic. Especially if you get something like a pishwari naan yeah. to go with. I love or a garlic naan. Love <sighs> Indian food. If I'm going out for food, Indian food is my favourite food to go out for. And I love spicy. Food. Guess what? John, we can we go, can out go for, food. for food soon. Yeah. Yes. Melissa needs to go to um, uh, Bombay Cottage. She never Bombay, been. Bombay, yeah, Bombay Cottage. That's where we took Doug. Yeah. yeah. Aye. So, Aye. Yeah. Double date. Absolutely. And I love. Uh, Yeehaw. You know, I'm usually uh, like uh, South Indian, South Indian garlic chili. Love it as as a curry, just absolutely delicious. But as the years go by, I find myself eating, choosing more and more to just go for a korma, and I don't know why. There's just something really delicious about that creamy concoction of a korma. Stick one on top of a pizza, which is a very Scottish thing. Magic. Oh, I like the, the the things that they put on fucking pizza <coughs> here is ridiculous. You get a chips pizza for one place, <laughs> you get a baked beans pizza for another. Like to to be fair, when I was in New York, I got a, a delicious pizza with a pasta bake on top of it, pasta bake pizza, and it was mm. it was very good. So uh, let's read through this lovely bit of fan mail from Kurt again. Yes, <laughs> Kurt. Uh, we have decided to come right back to this because we read out obviously the the uh, computer blue screen, so we didn't get the recording. But I was very keen to go through this because you were kind enough to write us quite a lot. Um, hey guys, enjoy watching your shows. Thought I'd share my story in case you fancy reading it in the fan mail section. Understand if it's a bit too long though. You can always try and edit it down a bit if you think it's worth telling. Um, I don't think it needs edited at all, mate. I think it's worth putting yep. everything you've put in here. It's more than concise for what it is. So. I've been playing guitar since I was 16, I'm now 34 years old and I've always been an introverted person unless I'm pissed. Common thing, mate. Music has been my only real passion in life. It's the only thing that's helped me really connect with people and keep me grounded. Just under two years ago I was stuck in a rut with my playing and I hadn't progressed in a long while with little motivation. Then one night, well overworked and tired, I tripped up on my elbow, the side from my picking hand went straight through a glass pane in a door. The top half of the pane smashed, leaving the bottom half that my elbow slammed into it and cut open. I instantly lost a feeling in half my hand, including the area that touches the string for palm muting. I couldn't spread my fingers out or bring my thumb to my index finger properly, and so I was rushed to A&E. 
I would fucking hope so, mate. That sounds <laughs> uh, traumatic, to say the least. Yeah. Um, after checks with a specialist, I was told I'd severed my ulnar nerve. It, had really, it hadn't really sunk in how serious it was at this point. I was cleaned up and put in a cast and to wait for an operation two days later to reconnect the nerve. Right before the operation, the surgeon told me that I would never get full feeling or normal movement back in my hand. I went dizzy as it finally hit me. I felt like I'd been punched in the stomach. Move forward six weeks post-operation, cast off. I couldn't even hold a pick. I was seriously contemplating what is the point in life anymore. I have nothing but music, nothing but playing guitar, and I was very much struggling mentally. After a week or two, I decided I wouldn't let this stop me. If I couldn't hold a normal pick, I thought maybe I could play if I clipped a finger pick to my index finger. But a load of different makes to try. I found one that fit well and sanded the ends down to a point to make them like a normal pointy pick. I then got practising. In less than a week, I was making musical sounds again. In just under two months, I was back on stage. It was one of the best feelings I've ever had. I couldn't play everything to the standard I'd been able to play before, so I decided that I need to reapproach the way I play. I needed a new way to impress people. I started to learn more complex chords, more interesting arrangements, and get out of the basic major minor boxes. I got more jazzy with my playing, and through the setback, I knew a more rounded, better player for it. It's amazing how sometimes a life-changing tragedy can turn into such a positive. I think of the likes of Tony Iommi and Django Reinhardt. Not that I could ever come close to their genius. <laughs> Don't sell yourself short, man. Without the accident, I believe I'd still be stuck in the rut, playing the same things I was two years ago and would have never progressed. As odd as it may sound, in some way, I'm glad it happened. If you made it this far, thanks for reading. Cut. He sent us that back in February, uh, and I wanted to read it in February. And my response to it was, got any videos, Kurt? <laughs> like, I, like I was fact-checking it, like, prove it, prove it, asshole. But no, I, the, re <laughs> the reason I did that, and we, we talked about um, video for a while, is because I wanted you guys to see. I wanted you to, to see, you know, people coming through adversity. So I'm just going to um, bring up on screen, here's a, um, a little example of Kurt showing off the pick on his finger. I love the ingenuity here. Adapt, improvise, overcome. Yeah, giving and, uh, himself this tiny little point that you can play with. It's, um, it's like holding a jazz three, essentially, but it's stuck to your finger. Yeah. When I played bass um, in a band previously... Oh, is this Kurt playing? Sorry, just yeah. put this on. Also, he's not, not playing with a, a pick at all here. Now, just from looking at this this hand, you can tell that this is somebody that has, has some sort of hand problem. You know, mm -hmm. this is... He's, he's doing the best he can with, with what he has. But I love it, though. It's got a really beautiful tone here. He's enjoying himself, and uh, here's him playing something a little bit more metal. New wave of heavy, heavy British heavy metal. Is that a take on Burn? Yeah. Isn't it? Or something kind of Judas Priestley? Still giving it all the beans. Absolutely. I actually want to use this as an opportunity to uh, to talk about. I'm gonna, not not segue per se. Mm -hmm. um, just before we just before we move on sure. totally, that is a fucking fantastic camera shot you've got there. Yeah, it yeah. looks great. I can't get camera shots that good. <laughs> that, that genuinely looks fantastic, yeah. mate. Um, credit where credit's due, and it sounds fantastic as well. Well done to you. Just because you mentioned Django, I thought this was uh, we've we've done Les Paul stories on the show before. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I and I I like Les. I like the the kind of the humbleness that goes around being someone as important as that. I, I love this picture and this re, wee story. So, in 1946, Les finally met Django, the doorman at the Paramount Yard. Les, there's someone here to see you. His name is Django Reinhardt, and I said, "Yeah, right. Send up Jesus Christ in a case of beer." I thought he was pulling my chain, so I wised off. <laughs> that's a great quote, and that's a fantastic picture. Yeah, because look, like the two of them look as if they're like, "Wow, I get to meet." Yeah, Django. I get to meet Les. It's yeah. cool, man. That's really cool. I like that a lot. I really like that. I actually. love it. So, um, yeah, definitely, definitely cool. You see, uh, Django's we uh, we claw there mm -hmm. on his left hand. It just goes to show, man. Ad adversity can either stop you or it can help you evolve, and yeah. that's fantastic. Years ago, I played bass in a band, and one of the things I did because it was quite intricate it was death metal, obviously. Yeah. Um, was the same idea as what Curtis saying with like a thumb pick or whatever but the way I had it was I had just like a normal thumb pick like I was playing finger style and I used it like a plectrum when I was using the fast tremolo parts and then I would move to finger style for bits that I needed to and to change tone and I never had to worry about dropping the plectrum 
So yep, that's the job. That's just me kind of using something for its intended purpose in a slightly different way. Yeah. Curtis has obviously went that step further and went, well, I'm actually going to do my own thing. So yeah. credit where credit's due me. That's a fucking cool thing. I Fair wanted to you. just do this bit of fan mail as well. This was sent to us back in January, actually, but it, it fell really in line with um, Phil, Phil Cross and his, mm -hmm. um, his custom builds. This isn't that quite a custom build, guitar. but this is uh, someone showing off a lockdown build because we did ask for your lockdown builds. Yes. And just because we haven't read your emails out in five months, don't think that I haven't put them all aside and gone, this is a good one. There'll be a good place to read this out. So. We could maybe do a bonus episode where we just go through that kind of stuff yeah. live or whatever, see if we can yeah. get people on if yeah. they want to. Um, so this is for John Brown. Uh, thanks for writing in, John. Hello, both. It's okay. I can live with not winning. Wouldn't want to change the habit of a lifetime at my age anyway. <laughs> I'm guessing that's in response to the Ormsby. Sorry, mate. Sorry. But there may be other competitions in future. Yeah. Can't really guarantee that we'll be giving away Ormsby's every year, but <laughs> <laughs> who knows? Perry, Perry. <laughs> yeah, in response to your request for picks of lockdown builds, here's what my youngest son, Felix, at 13, and I got up to back in the heady days of lockdown 1.0. <laughs> I built a parts caster out of various bits I had around, including an Eric Johnson thin line body, which I resprayed in nitro desert sand. This is a really lovely nice colour, mainly this. used for budget Fender models in the 60s. Felix built a Stumac telly from scratch, including green filling and finishing in seafoam green nitro. He did brilliantly. Love the show, love you guys. Here's a stupid question. Given identical practice routines, could any two players achieve the same level of technical proficiency? Big hugs, John. Uh, just... Fucking hell, John! You and Felix have done quite the job. It's a nice, wow. nice colour, isn't it? A really nice colour on that, uh, Eric Johnson. Th both of those guitars are minted. Yeah. Absolutely minted. Credit to both of these. Wow. Yeah, so good good work. And how about the question? Uh, oh, this is a really good one. Yeah. Um, I think it would depend entirely on the players. I think uh, what probably changes technical proficiency is when you started guitar and how serious you were. Yeah. Because if you are a child prodigy that started playing guitar at three when you had infinite neuroplasticity and you just picked up like a second language, you're always probably going to be more proficient than someone yeah. who spent 10 hours a day from age 15 to 20 just because your brain develops better at that age. Yeah, your brain sucks things up better at that age. I think it depends how strict you're being on the word identical. If, you, if it's an identical practice routine where the two people have to play the exact same exercises for the exact same amount of time, mm -hmm. I reckon you're probably going to end up with players that are going to be similarly proficient, assuming they're of yeah. similar age. Yeah. Um, because I think developing beyond another player requires you going beyond the practice routine. It's exploring, it's experimenting, it's pushing yourself, it's um, following interests. I, I think, you know, as a notion, it's going to be impossible to give people identical practice routines because I think the beauty of, of music is that it's a deeply personal thing and we all have different levels of influences. Even if you, you've only ever heard two bands, you know, Iron Maiden and Black Sabbath, those are your only musical influences. And you've got two guys who those are their only musical influences. Well, unless they're both influenced in the equal amount between the two bands by the same aspects of each band, you're going to end up in two different players. Mm -hmm. One player might be 80% Iron Maiden and 20% Sabbath. One person might be 10% Sabbath, 10% Maiden, and 80% and, and atonal noise. Like, it's, yeah, music is, is deeply personal. And, and I think that uh, practice routines, you know, help people achieve similar goals. I'm not, I don't consider myself a technique teacher. I don't really take students on for technique, but my old friend Martin Goulding, one of my old tutors, is um, he's the master of that, teaching that stuff. And he's he the has, chap with the cherry red, or, uh, sorry, candy red RGR465. He does have one of those. Or is that yeah. the original? Sorry, it's an RGE. Yeah, it's RGE. 465. 565. Stunning guitars. Love those. Um, and he, you know, he deals, he's dealt with hundreds, if not thousands of students teaching technique, and he's developed the, the routines that you work on. And he's militant about how, the routine, what you practice, how you practice, how long you practice it for. I'd have an egg timer as part of my practice routines, practicing the right exercises for the right amount of time. There was mm -hmm. no getting out of it. Um, and yeah, it works. It definitely works. He he knows. It's not like he's ever got to a point in his career where he's gone, huh, there are some people where these routines just don't help them achieve the things that they want to achieve. So I think um, practice routines are, can help you achieve a similar level of proficiency. But it comes down to the player and their dedication to putting in the, putting in the time. I think even the biggest Ingve fans. I tell you a good example. Max Ostro, he has copied every guitarist you can imagine that's ever had any sort of a, or sorry, studied, not copied, every guitarist you can imagine who's had any sort of instructional DVD or yeah. material syllabus out, and he's very good at quoting their syllabus and doing a good job of it. But they always sound like Max, yes. whereas they always sound like they themselves. Yeah. So, in my brain, I kind of see it as like, if you gave two people 
identical books in the same training to write a book about the same subject would mm. it come out the same they might tell the same story but they use different words yeah so it's going to read different yeah does that make sense totally. it's, it's almost like there's always going to be a personal touch to it an idiosyncrasy here or there that's fair but cool question thank you yeah. and thanks very much for writing in yeah so send us more fan mail gsoulsfanmail at gmail.com link is in the description of wherever you are listening or watching this uh, let's get on with the show by talking about Jason Becker yes glad that we can start with some good news for a wee change a few episodes ago as you all know and anyone that follows Jason's social media you'll know fine well that Jason was unwell again for a bit of time and uh, anyone is aware of Jason's story as soon as there's anything that's almost like a, a turn for the worst for Jason we all kind of expect the worst I think yeah, yeah. Um, despite him being probably or quite obviously one of the most mentally strong people on yeah. earth told it it didn't have a chance and yet here he fucking is still writing music still being an inspiration putting still... Kurt to shame Kirk Kurt. It. oh Kurt <laughs> 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 that's it <laughs> Kurt ah surgery in my hand Jason Becker hold my beer yeah quit whining hold my beer because I can't <laughs> carry on oh come on right, hey everyone. I will apologise for nothing I know you won't so I'm going to fucking cancel the episode <laughs> hey, hi everyone I'm finally starting to feel like myself again after many months of scary health issues and thinking I was on my way out once again, thank you for all your prayers and well wishes. I honestly feel the energy and I'm very grateful. It feels so good to know you're out there and your kindness and support brings tears to my eyes. How can I possibly thank Herman Lee, Nayla, Colleen, Stephen, Amy and all the musicians who got together and donated their time and guitars, put their hearts into the music, all for my benefit. Your loving words and gestures are humbling and I am honoured. Thank you all. I am blessed beyond belief for each and every one of you. I'm hoping to be able to check in on the computer and try and keep up with everyone as much as my energy will allow me and I hope to get back to music in some form as much as I can. I thank you all from the bottom of my heart. This family and I could not have gotten this far without you all, Jason Becker. And that's a beautiful message and it's very much as to be expected from Jason. I don't think I've ever heard MD say a terrible or even slightly critical thing about him yeah. and that's not just personal but professionally. Yeah, and, and and artistically, like he's an imp- inspiration to many, and it's easy to say an inspiration to many, but not me. But in this case, it's very much an inspiration to many, myself included. Like, Absolutely, but in timeless, a- a- endless hours into practice and to to learn Becker's stuff as, oh, a, as a kid. You would need to yeah. <laughs> even learning cacophony stuff. You just sit for hours playing the same arpeggios until you eventually get it a wee bit tight, and then you go to play it in context, and you go, "Oh wait, I'm not Jason Becker yeah. or Matt Friedman." <laughs> Whoops! I wanted one of those blue carvings. Oh, who did name I? For so the long, DC four hundred yeah. with a maple fretboard, and I've just oh. loaded, uh, I've loaded uh, a, a wee video up that we that we can have a, a wee look at here right. to just showcase good guy Andy James. So, um, speaking of Jason Becker and and those guys, mm-hmm. Andy James just posted this on on Instagram, and I and I really enjoyed this. He doesn't know about this yet. So here we go. A little bird told me that Roy Kelly 777 has wanted this Jason Becker guitar since the 80s, but never owned one. Luckily, I know a guy that right, makes it. You're not them. looking, right? No. You, got eyes. you sure? Yeah. <laughs> Say when. Hit me with that big dick. I love that the two comments at the top are Angel Vivaldi okay. Open your eyes. and McLaughlin. That's because I follow them. What the fuck them. did you do, dude? But at the same time, yeah. I like that it's guys what in the, the industry, well known names. Oh my god. <laughs> it's a Becker. Yeah. Holy fucking shit, really? It's yours, mate. How did that happen, dude? Jeff, oh, you, you know, know how long I've been wanting one of these? I know a guy, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Holy fucking shit. There's more top names. Man, Andy, 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 Andy Timmons. Man. Five Finger Death Punch. Chris Kale, okay, Ivan so Moody. Just turned up to Roy's. He doesn't know about this shit. That's fantastic, man. That's nice. Good, good guy, Andy James. Aye, well done, Andy. That's fantastic. And you know what? You can tell that's a genuine reaction because it's not as if he's showing the guitar off for the camera. He's going, holy shit, what the <laughs> fuck? Did you get this? Yeah. And it's so cool, man. I've wanted, uh, wanted one of those for a uh, long time, so I'm very jealous. I'm also going to say good guy Jeff Kiesel for helping me. Yeah. I have to give credit where credit's due. Yeah. We, we like to be fair yeah. and uh, objective here. So good and, on you, mate. Well done. But I have to say, Andy's done a lot of lot of wonderful things for me Andy's been a, a good guy for me and to to be honest I probably wouldn't have my career if it wasn't for, for Andy oh really um, yeah he was another student at Martin Goldings so I got to meet him via via Martin doing some work with Martin and then Andy it was Andy and Tom Quayle that started to hook me up with Lick Library and then nice. you know all of their professional contacts mm-hmm. 
Um, and so. he's doing well for himself. I'm glad that the hard work's paying off for him. Yeah. So, Which is uh, good, man. It's good. Uh, I wonder when he's going to... I'm not even going to make the joke. For him that doesn't know, Levi hoodwinked me under the guise of having a fucking jewellery endorsement <laughs> two years ago yeah. to get my ring size so that Nancy could propose to me. <laughs> and me, the fanny that I was like, oh, I ain't bother, I'll go ring size. Oh, but I wouldn't have been able to do that without Andy, though, because he had a he had a rock metal jewellery endorsement. And, and that as soon as I saw that, I was like, that's... And that's what you said. You're like, yeah. oh, Andy, Andy James is getting a few and apparently they're interested in us just because of the podcast. I was like, oh, okay, fair enough. And you just played it so casual, like, I mean, we'll just, we'll get them, we'll see what they're like, and if it's worth it, we'll, we'll take them or not. And I'm like, ah, okay, fair enough. Yeah. You bastard. <laughs> in a good way. In a good way. I do my best, though. That's You're a big I, sick. Sometimes I try. Other times I don't. You uh, always try. You just like <laughs> to kid on that you don't. You're so casual about it. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's talk about my favourite. Before uh, we move on, let's just be totally frank here, right? The internet sees you as big, bad, point everybody's flaws out, dick, Levi. You are as fucking loyal as they come probably the most loyal yeah but i don't want anyone to know that so thanks for <laughs> oh, but they need to get into the circle first so they need to prove themselves yeah uh, that is and, it, well, and i got in there by harassing you about buckethead <laughs> and then saying why don't we do a podcast <laughs> but that's the thing isn't it like um you 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 joke there but even if that was 100 percent true like there are a lot of people that i consider very close dear friends now that i've got to know because they harass me on facebook <laughs> and i harass them back you know like it's good to to have conversations with people that you, that you share legitimate interests and passions with, and people that you totally. have a, have a respect for. And if anyone has takes the time out of their day to send me a message, I respect that person for that, and I respect totally. that that I'm in a position where somebody would want to send me a message. So you can bet That's I'm going to fucking read it. You can bet I'm going to send you a message back. And uh, you want to be part of the inner circle, you know. Get involved. Anybody that wants to be involved can be part of the uh, inner circle. I'm never going to get to uh, to famous youtuber status where i'm too fucking arrogant to answer my own emails or no you're going to be too arrogant to set up two-step verification yeah <laughs> go on do it i knew you wanted to la i knew you wanted to laugh about it <laughs> yeah so you know how we're talking about crypto and stevie t and yeah. his channel takeover i know I'm, I'm totally jumping in in this story you're telling uh, the next story so oh, we've not even um, started it so you know how you sent me a thing about crypto totally being a scam and there being an exit scam which yeah. is the most common of them all and the website literally reading we have scammed you of all your money and there's fuck all you can do about it what was it they left with 3.2 million uh 32 million 32 million, 32 million. Uh, it just reminds me of hate to say i told you so because that is exactly what i was going to that has have the been hype saying. song yes yeah yeah it's going to be music related i was watching uh, it's also a banger of a tune i was watching daddy's home last night the uh will ferrell and uh Mark i've never Wolfe seen film. that it's really good it's really good and the second one's really good too but uh that that song was was synced in it and i'm like classic that's a banger it's there going tune. back 20 years now mm -hmm. <laughs> so old <laughs> good tune though great tune. absolute banger and um, probably the, the the first of the kind of indie rock bands that i can remember that yeah. were still rocky rather than more indie yeah that's just me again i'm not much an indie guy so uh can you think of any of their other songs i know they had other songs who was it again hives the hives yeah The Hives didn't do Get Free, didn't they not? That was The Vines. That wasn't The Hives, no. Let's, I'll, have, I'll have a quick look. Uh, last Night, she said... No. no, who's that? Don't know. Uh, I don't know. Anyway. They did have a, another... Um, I've probably heard it. They totally had another song that was popular, but I'm not seeing it in there. Because it didn't exist. You've made it up. Walk Idiot Walk, Main Offender, Tick Tick Boom. No. Two, it, oh, two, two Time In Touch and, bro and Broken Bones. That was popular. I don't think I know that one. I maybe know the song, but I don't know the title. Yeah. Um, two points, very quickly. You're talking about sliding into the DMs and mm -hmm. somebody sends you a message, you're going to take your time to get back to them. Yeah. Perfect example being Monday Night Guitar Geek Club. Yeah. Represent trips. Thank you. Hopefully we're at 6 to 9 live viewers. Every time it's come up so far, I've tried to screenshot it and it's <laughs> went to 6 to 8 or 70. It's <laughs> disappointing. We had a record, what, 125? A couple of episodes ago, yeah. That's fucking crazy. So yeah. thank you. Whether you're popping in to say hello just checking us out even if you leave a thumbs down that's fine actually i would just leave a thumbs up then rather than me and levi just constantly being in the comments going it really helps us with the algorithm and the engagement you know yeah. just there but, <laughs> uh, but anyway it illustrates the point like we're going to be there on a monday night and if you can't be there i'm definitely going to be there you know like um, we'll take our thumbs won't we because you know that's, pals that's what that's what we do not just for us but like for you guys like right. Yeah. I'm channeling the spirit of Emmanuel Aguilar. Yeah. Hugs, brothers. Exactly. Hugs. 
I might be well known for calling people cunts on the internet, but generally speaking, it's takes one in all one. Have you got to see? No, I was going to say I'm usually calling people cunts because of the way they treat and think about you guys. Yes, the way that they would, the, how stupid they think that you are. I'm going to call someone a cunt for that. Like it's just I can't help myself. If I see someone bullying someone in your position, like I'm gonna, I'm gonna be like, look at this guy, he's an asshole. Um, yeah, love so, that, love that. Yeah. We need to look after each other, especially, especially in the hard times. Yes. Anyway, as so, I was saying about fucking Stevie T, right? Oh, okay. Cool. So you sent me a thing about the exit scam, whatever website yeah, it yeah. was, right? And obviously, what happened with Stevie T is his account was taken over yes. by some sort of crypto mining or a shilling account. Uh, I have two theories on how that could have happened, right? Um, and one is related to crypto, funnily enough, right? So, right. my brother and I were talking about this, and we were kind of chatting over it, just like, can you believe that that's what it actually was? The two-step authentication and verification yeah. was switched off. Both of us were pretty shocked, but we kind of come up with two ideas we thought it might be. The first one, which is potential, but doesn't really explain how it got hacked, as they didn't have two-step verification on because Stevie was getting fed up of sending codes to his management when they were uploading videos, or whoever it was that was dealing with the account. Because with two-step, yep. you need to verify it as a different device or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe it got to the point they were fed up with that, and it was just that, I'm taking that off so that you've got access and so have I. Sure. Which would explain there not being two-step verification on and what happened. Sure. But what I think probably happened is, and maybe I'm totally wrong, this is complete conjecture, you know how Stevie's always got, um, I don't want to say inappropriate, but unrelated sponsors for the most part of his content? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have an awful feeling Stevie's been contacted by some sort of crypto trading site, supposed crypto trading site, right? and went, do you want to do an advert for us? You can sign up here or whatever. He's clicked a dodgy link and it stole his account because he didn't have to step on, which makes sense with the content they were posting. Uh, I can see why you why why you'd say that, but I would also say that Stevie won't be dealing with his emails. So if someone's clicked on it, it will be someone that's clicked on it for him. Potentially, but, but my yeah, point being, like that would be a way in. I would think that um, given he's not <coughs> exactly selective of sponsorships to his what's meant to be music comedy mm. content, I suppose. Um, I think it's very uh, likely that he could have. Oh, when, totally possible. Okay, well, there's a crypto company that are going to give me lots of money. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, given that he did that with that mental health yeah. advocacy, whatever it was meant to that be, website that was an absolute fucking joke. Yeah. Probably caused more hassle than it actually, or like good than it did. So yeah. that was, I mean, uh, we keep, I keep plugging my piano sponsorship link mm -hmm. because I'm just super open about that. If you sign up for a free trial at piano, they give me money. They mm -hmm. don't give me a hundred bucks. And Stevie was getting a hundred bucks for uh, every person that signed up for, uh, for better help, which is ridiculous. 100 bucks capitalised no, on your mental health struggles. And of course, doing it by saying, I have mental health problems myself. I know. Nothing says altruism like literally profiting off the misery of others. Yeah. Fuck <laughs> you, Stevie. I'm glad you get your channel back, mate. I wouldn't want to take food off your, your table or cause you any problems, but get a grip. Maybe, that, maybe that's always the sobering reminder that he is human also. Hmm. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah, I think um, it's, a, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because we obviously talk about mental health awareness and, and getting seek, seeking help. I just can't imagine a company like... But I tell you what, if a company like BetterHelp were to approach us to help like offer mental health services for people mm -hmm. um, and they were offering us $100 for everybody that signed up for, for, for things, I'd take that, but I wouldn't want the $100. I would want that $100 to be discounted off the person who signs up. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because when it comes to mental health awareness and, and helping people with mental health struggles and encouraging people to get help, you want to make that as easy as possible for them. Yeah. Not as profitable for as for possible for us. I mean, what what I would add to that is that if a company approached us to say, we want to sponsor you because you talk about mental health and we'll give you a kickback for everybody that signs up, I would just say no entirely, based on the fact that it's profit again for the fact that someone's having a hard time. I don't know what the cost was to sign up for this, but just put your money towards finding someone locally yeah. who is actually accredited yes. or ask for a referral through your doctors. Yep. Don't, I mean, free apps like Headspace and they'll give you meditation, guided meditations, whatever else. Brilliant. Doesn't cost you any money. You can buy the ones if you want, like the more advanced courses or you like certain instructors. And at least that way you're not 
pouring money into a company that's claiming they're maybe putting somebody in front of you that could be prof- uh, professional and might not be yep. and whatever else um i just uh I, I feel that if your health and well-being is behind a paywall then it's probably not in anyone's interest to advertise that i agree fair yeah fuck paywalls um okay so a little bit of zach wild because you know he's my hero uh, they have just released Black Label Society. I keep getting ads for it on my Facebook. They've released uh, the None More Black vinyl set, Black Label Society vinyl set. Right? I would love, I would love, love, love to buy this. Much as it six hundred and sixty six. It's actually dollars. not even all that expensive, believe no. it or not. Um, for for vinyl, I'm just going to bring it up because because I, I want it. Are you going to buy it's, it? I'm not going to buy it because I just I've got a record player set up now in my in my um dining room, mm-hmm. but I just. These are stunning. Like, you know, every Black Label Society, like double vinyl, coloured vinyl, is super cool. And they I, do look fucking great. I mean, the, uh, is it the 1919 Eternal disc that's the dark grey? Like, it looks like gravel. This is, this one. Aye. That's uh, Sonic Brew. Sonic Brew, sorry, that looks fucking brilliant. One. Yeah, yeah, so t- super, super cool. So have a stab, have a guess, how much? So 150 this is, bucks. This is, one, two, three, four, five, 12 albums, uh, Quite and a few all in... Most of them are doublers. There's uh, uh, eight double albums in there. There's a bottle opener, uh, a picture book. Yeah, a big picture and book. And a big a, fucking a, patch. A patch. For if you uh, ride a motorbike and want to get yourself in trouble yeah. with actual motorcycle clubs. So so 12 vinyl records, you're guessing? You said it's reasonable. I'm going to say 200 quid. You're about right there. 275. Ooh. Which, in all it's not the worst. No, it's not. It's not the worst for, for this, this big patch, this big pack. And I could have got fifteen percent discount on it, but uh, it's still a lot of money. It's still a lot of money. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Um, anyway, let's uh, let's read this story. Yes. So, well, we're not really reading the story. I just really like this uh, this idea of uh, Osborne basically killed himself in accident, and also uh, how Zach feels about Ozzy excluding himself. Sorry, excluding him from the new Ozzy album. So, it's that'll be this bit here. Yes, so the question was, it's been all over the news that you'll not be playing on Ozzy's newest album. Zach also hasn't played on Ozzy's previous album, 2020's Ordinary Man. Uh, You're cool with it? And Zach replied, yeah, I'll just be the godfather of our oldest son, so yeah, my relationship's bigger than the music with Oz. Uh, And Oz said to me years ago, Zach, I don't want to be the lead singer of Black Label Society. You're your own guy now, you've got your own thing. I completely get it. Oz knows I'm always here for him. Whatever he needs me to do, if he needs me to bring over some milk and eggs, I'll do it. If I've got to clean up the dog because he's got some company coming over and he's got to run some errands, I'll do it. It's that easy. And if the boss is ready to rock and roll on the road again after he gets the album knocked out, if he calls me up, Zach, come over on Tuesday, we're going to go over. All right, no problem. I'll see you on Thursday, not Tuesday. Uh, that's the way we roll. <laughs> no, nope. no, you, you've totally Aye. got that right. <laughs> come over on Tuesday, right, I'll see you on Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay, fair enough. Um, I, I like that. I think they've always had that kind of relationship, haven't they? Yes. Like, just super close and totally honest. And the stories I heard about when Ozzy was auditioning guitarists and obviously Zach got the, the role was because Ozzy had basically said, I wanted somebody that did their own thing. I didn't want another Randy. I didn't want another yeah. Jake Ely. I wanted someone who was themselves, and that was... Zach. So I get the impression that their relationship from D dot was I'll tell you the truth if you tell me the truth and we'll just go on really easy that way. Which I like. I think yeah. that's um it's a really, really good basis for any sort of relationship. Um what we what else were you asking about there, sorry, but uh Ozzy basically killing himself for the next album? No, no, just uh, after his ATV accident. Um yeah, when he ex- How many times has this man nearly killed himself? Let's be totally honest. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing he's still here. Maybe Ozzy started COVID. Maybe. I mean, it certainly didn't get him. I'm just saying, yeah. we're talking about back wing soup. Yeah. Ozzy bit the head off a live bat. True. Uh, so I'm just qu- saying. <laughs> the question is, if I ask you to tell me the craziest story about life with Ozzy, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Maybe silence or nothing going on. There's always something going on. Tour was going great, everything was happening. Then he basically almost kills himself and breaks his neck just going out to take a leak and go to the bathroom. And I saw him in the hospital. We're like, what are you doing now? And he goes, I guess I was bored. I needed something to happen. It's always something, whether it's the ATV, him almost killing himself and that thing. He goes to take a piss in the middle of the night and he comes back, he almost breaks his neck. It's always something. <laughs> I like how casual that sentence is. Just like, it's always something me, Ozzy, isn't it? Like, breaking his neck, biting animals, heads off. <laughs> Getting coke delivered in personal boxes. Yeah. I just... <laughs> wild. So, um, moving on. What's this Boss Unveil uh, pair of limited edition effects pedals? 
to mark musical milestones. Yes, so Boss have reimagined their SD1 Super Overdrive and the MT2 Metal Zone pedals to celebrate their anniversaries. And I kind of thought to myself, is this going to be another situation of people scalping these pedals? Because if anyone has paid attention to the Boss Waza craft stuff, and the they were expensive in the first place. Absolutely, but yeah. people have had them hooked online for seven, eight hundred quid plus. Fuck off. <laughs> Actually, fuck off. Just get yourself to fuck. But I guarantee the same thing is going to happen with the Metal Zone and Super Overdrives that are done in these uh, limited edition ones. I believe the only difference is the finish on them. I think it it's so just the casings, it. isn't it? I'll read through this just now. Uh, Boss have unveiled a pair of limited edition effects pedals to celebrate significant milestones in their history. The Japanese firm will release anniversary editions of their popular SD1 Super Overdrive and the MT2 Metal Zone pedals later this year. With the SD1 4A marking the 40th year of the Super Overdrive, while the MT2 3A will commemorate, uh, commemorate 30 years of the Metal Zone pedal. Dead easy names. <laughs> uh, the SD1 4A is presented in black with yellow lettering, gold cap, knobs and a vintage silver thumb screw for the battery compartment and comes in a box with a special 40th anniversary logo. The MT2 3A, meanwhile, is also black but has grey lettering with the same vintage silver thumb screw and comes in a presentation box marked with a 30th anniversary logo. Don't like that grey lettering. I, hard to see I think it looks cool as fuck but I think that's the whole point right. uh, Boss say many Boss compact pedal models uh, sorry many Boss compact pedal models have continuously produced for multiple decades and the SD1 Super Overdrive and MT2 Metal Zone are two of the most revered yep. scores of innovative and trend setting guitarists across all genres have adopted these pedals for their core tones and used them to create some of the most popular and Levi scrolls away sorry, sorry. <laughs> popular and influential music of all time yeah. both pedals will be released in June nothing about pricing yeah, so but I fully expect them to be more expensive. Yeah, um, we were talking in the chat last week about boss pedals. Um, was it Stephen Austin was talking about um, what do people think about boss pedals? And I kind of flippantly said cheap shite. Mm -hmm. Not that I'm paraphrasing myself there, but you know, growing up, and I'm sure it was probably the same case for you, boss pedals were the pedals that you would see everywhere because they were well distributed. You know? Yes, I call it the industry standard the same way that everybody did yeah. the SM57, yeah. SM58. They're not cheap shite at all, but they're and and you wouldn't even call them entry level. But to me, they're the it's the equivalent of like the Schecter. They're the Schecter guitar. There's the Schecter pedals of the the Schecter product of the pedals world. The the, the, the Telecaster, of the pedals world. Everybody's got one. Yeah, and it does the core job that you need it to. I'm trying to think. I mean, I own a lot of pedals and I don't have a single boss pedal. <laughs> really? You've not even got the TU tuner? Nah. No, I use the Peterson Strobo Stomp. Oh, that's right enough. Because you're um, a big show off bastard. Because I want to be really tuned. Yeah. yeah. The TU3 actually is a, is a very good tuner. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I've had boss pedals over the years, but I actually really like the design of them. I like the enclosure. I think the, the foot mechanism for it and the screw to get to the battery compartment, I think it's, they're really, it's a nice design. Um, it's very easy, not complicated. They're very distinct looking as well. Yeah, like there is no, certainly no middle ground. And you look at it, you know whether it's a boss pedal or not. Yeah, but there have been a lot of um, shite ones. Well, yeah, a lot of shite ones, but a lot of companies have started up by modifying boss pedals. And the way really? I see it is, yeah, they're if, all seeing eye mod. Yeah, with yeah. the brightest blue LED on earth. Yeah, I had one of those. Aye, can you still see? <laughs> Great pedal. Just switch it on, and end up fucking. <laughs> It's but, like, see the bit in uh, Indiana Jones? Oh, yeah, he yeah. He opens no, the crypt yeah, yeah. and the light comes out. Yeah. That's, that's like turning one of those lc and <laughs> mods on. Um, so I, I love, um, I loved that distortion pedal, the DS1. Um, but the way I've always seen it is, well, if another company can come in and modify this and make it significantly better, then surely the starting product wasn't the thing that I should be buying. And that kind of put me off the brand in general. And the other okay. question that Stephen asked was, if you could go for a multi-effects unit or individual pedals, what would you go for? And again, it's the, the idea of like, well, you just have to look at what people use. Sure, a multi-effects unit is convenient, but it doesn't do all of the sounds. It imitates the sounds. It's not an all analog. It's a computer imitating what an analog chip would do. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you go for a selection of pedals, you might have fewer sounds at your disposal. You might have more cables and shit, but you are you're trying to go for the most analog version of that that uh concept you're using the 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 same chip sets for 
I the think correct it, chipsets, I should say. I think it depends entirely on what units you're talking about as well. Yes. Nobody's going to take a, a Behringer pedal board over a Helix. But Fair. in the same respect, you're not going to take a GE200 over like your pedal board, yeah. which I'm not saying yours All is over totally, the floor. <laughs> you know what I mean? But yeah. like your pedals aren't like super prestigious, but you've got quite a lot of one off pedals. Yeah. Your, your Dalalama. Um, you've got a lot of Wampler on there. Yeah. Like there's a lot of really nice things on there, but it's not as if every single thing on there is like fucking. Uh, Eventide, etc. You know what I mean? Like, ah, but same, same, similar price price points for for most of that stuff. Like, oh, totally. The only there's some cheap things on there, like the TC, TC electronic stuff. I think is largely fantastic. Mm-hmm. I've got the the buffer, the TC electronic buffer on there. I did use the Polytune because I've got the limited edition, the Polytune Noir, the black one. Um, great, great tuner. Great tuner. Yeah. Uh, was, oh, and I was. What about the, the high road that we fuzz you got? That's a wee cheap pedal, wasn't it? Which one? The high road, that wee blue fuzz. That was not cheap. Was no. it not? No, no, sorry. No, it's a boutique fuzz. That's a it... Joey Landruff signature. Oh, is it? I didn't know that. Sorry. Yeah, I picked that up uh, when I went to see Joey. I got it at a gig. I'm talking shit. I'm thinking about the fact you bought the cheap clone. Yes, the Centaur. Yeah. That's right. Which, to be fair, wasn't bad. So. No, it actually sounded really good. <laughs> Although I've seen a few people talking about, I want to buy a real one because it doesn't sound good, and you can't convince me otherwise. I'm like, well, it's the same circuit we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Or at least as similar as it's going to get for fucking thirty quid. Yeah. Anyway. But um, that's my point. I think my my argument would be that it depends entirely on what pedals you're going yeah. for versus what multi effects you'd be going for. Yeah, uh, a multi effects. If if you need everything that's in the multi effects unit, then by all means. But uh, the way I see it is, you'd probably only need three or four sounds. So just use three or four sounds. I've got a Kemper, and I use three or four four sounds on it. You've got a two notes torpedo live that you've never plugged anything into. You you have so much gear that we have yet to have fun with. Um, <laughs> I tell you what, you all you need. Quite honestly, right? I'm just going to knock this argument out of the park. All you need is a Zoom 707 Mark II. See, I was going to say, uh, is it the RP, the Digitech RP20? Maybe DP20? Whatever the... I remember growing up, a couple of guys had that little Digitech stomp box that had two, two foot pedals the on The grey one? Yeah. <laughs> Very similar to the one I'm talking about. The Zoom came before right. that. It right, had okay. like... Do you remember the old cable boxes that had the two-letter red screen on the front? Yes. And yeah. they were like shitty digital screen. Yeah, yeah. That's what it had on the front as a strip. <laughs> and it had like 10 characters maybe. Yeah. And the sounds in it were abhorrent. Abhorrent. But it was class at the same time because it had loads of crazy yeah. harmonizers and yeah. pitch shifters. and. <sighs> if memory serves me right, the, uh, the Digitech had one of those screens but only two characters on it. And it just cycled through the numbers 1 through 19 because there were 19 different patches on it. And then the patch names were written down the side, you know, printed on the side. Ah, I know the one you're on about. Oh, it's got a wee grey knob in the front as well. You can change some of the like models. Doug shite. Oh, uh, <laughs> we've been through a lot of Doug shite sounding things, man. Let's be honest. Yeah. And there's something magic about just plugging into a, a just an amp and mm-hmm. you know, um, what can you get out of the amp? Derek Truck style. The man uses nothing. It's just just. Nothing but showing off like fuck. Yeah, it's easy to be distracted by by effects pedals. Yes, I think the that is a really really good thing to just to talk about the the quest for tone. Um, it took me a while to realise that the biggest part of that quest for tone is actually your fucking cabinet, Mm. is actually the speaker, or your IR. (laughs) You know what I mean, though. Like that is the the main component that will affect how good and how bad your stuff will sound. You could have the best signal path on earth. Yeah. The most boutique, clean, no noise floor, perfectly gated, wired, perfect, the quietest buffered power supply on earth, the best cables, everything shielded. And if it's going out a shit cab, it's going to sound shit. Yeah. Just simple as that. Yeah. Um, and if IRs also weren't worth, you know, the same, say, a demonstration of that principle being true, you wouldn't have so many successful businesses selling IRs. Correct. People buy good custom IRs because they really do, like, just pluck up your sound and make you sound you know make you sound great when i got that rev you know i knew to bet your bottom dollar i was getting a rev cab to go with it because yes, you a good solid quality um cab there. to go with it and with i'm probably going to order beautiful tolex yeah i'm probably going to order a, a 1x12 to go with the d20 i'm probably going to keep the d20 in the house oh yeah oh 1x20 1x20 i'd love a 1x20 to, to i was go. thinking about trying to build a cab i've been thinking about it for years yeah. What would your dream cab be? Have you thought about it? No one. Is that too much? Right, fair enough. Yeah. What is it the Sunders again? Is it V thirties? Yes. Both sides. Yeah. I think if I was to build a cab, right? This is genuinely what I would love to do. I'd have a two by twelve, and then a one by fifteen in the same cab. Mm-hmm. 
So the two B12s would be front firing. They'd be slightly off angle to avoid phase cancellation as much mm -hmm. as possible. I would have a V30 and a K100. So it would sound fucking tremendous. All the attack, loads of low end. But also it'd have an active uh, crossover in it. Cut maybe, I'd probably sweep it between 80 and 120 hertz. So that the 15 can take all the low end. And I'd also have the cab ported and I'd have the 15 firing downwards. I've put absolutely no no thought into this. So. That I'm telling you that now that would be a monstrous sounding cab if it was the right size yeah. and the right dimensions. Think you've got all the, the treble and mids pushing out for the front and then you're allowing the low end to not be bogging these speakers down sure. so they're completely in their optimum power range and then the 15 would be the same. I'd probably use something like an Eminence Kappa, something ridiculous and have that fire on the low end out and the, the cab be ported to make up for that. Only real experimentation I've done in that area is practicing and trying the difference between uh, a 2 by 12 and a 2 by uh, sorry a 1 by 12 and a 2 by 10 mm -hmm. that fit in the same enclosure mm. um, and I I prefer uh, the 2 by 10 I thought the two ten inch speakers sounded sounded quite worth playing a lot of country so um, you know a, lot, more of the a lot of the low end clean twangy yeah mm -hmm. All right. so I do like a 2 by 10 but uh, yeah you know cheap, you could cheap always do cheerful, 2 by 12 does, does the job you do your 2 by 10s and then a, a 12 down your bass but, end or a 15. Or, or I could just fire it into the two notes torpedo, the uh, torpedo live, and have a selection of IRs. <laughs> Can you argue that? Um, okay, let's move on to this. Joe Bonamassa, again. God, we keep talking about Joe Bonamassa on this fucking podcast. Is it no bad enough this man has got all the money and all the gear? <laughs> yeah. Now he's getting all the fucking flash. Yeah. Joe Bonamassa asks for safe return of missing fender, the bludgeon no caster. Worth pointing out, he's already got it back. <laughs> yeah, this was only six days ago, and uh, I think it went so hot to handle that it went, oh, I better just return it. I don't even know if that was the case. It was misplaced by FedEx, and then it showed up. And it's easy it to look at that, that and say, say, oh, yeah, well, clearly somebody at FedEx stole it, and then when they realised it was too hot to handle, they decided to find it again. Or somebody just put it behind the door accidentally right. and then or, eventually it turned up. Or it's just a courier service. We yeah. all know that yeah. couriers are terrible. Yeah. I think Joe's point was that he was getting conflicting information, which yeah. I can totally understand sure. why he would jump to the conclusion of, right, neighbor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because if you want to remember, the post was the guitar got sent, it made yeah. it to the distribution centre, it was shown it was up and down and then it just disappeared. Something like that. Um, in fact, if you can get the tweet, we'll read it. Uh, Dear FedEx, I would like my guitar back. It's JB006, Fender Custom No Caster that was on its way to Guitar World for review 10 days ago. You say it's missing. I say it was stolen. Your own videos prove it was scanned into your distribution centre in Nashville and never left. I mean, I've experienced that exact thing. And it's so in entirely easy for something to be scanned in and then fall off a conveyor belt and be between a conveyor belt and a wall or to, for somebody to put it aside because it's a bulky package and they put it and somebody opens the door and it just sits behind the door mm -hmm. and then misses a, you know, going on to the next thing and it takes them a while to to um, to um find it. I think jumping to the conclusion that it's stolen might be a bit of a jump there, Joe. At the same time, I like that he used his platform to be like, be better. Sure. Get the fucking finger out. Because sure. really, if this had been you or I and we'd raised these concerns, you would just get a shitty answer for the depot. That, yeah, well, that is true. And so, that, to Joe be just fair, put we in the. Know if FedEx responded. Uh, yeah. Hi, this is Karen. I'd regret to hear you're having issues with yeah. your shipment. Please send a DM. Ah, the, the generic. Isn't it? It's so bad. Yeah. <laughs> I hate it. Yeah, if you just send us a message, yeah. like, well, I've already been on the phone to your customer yeah, yeah. service. You I like very much somebody that works on a third party PR firm that's do dealing with the social media accounts is yeah, going yeah. to do any better than somebody in the depot. Yeah. But. It's just in in this Pressure. particular example, like if your guitar was stolen, it wouldn't have been scanned in, because you for it to have been scanned in and be stolen, you're implying that it's some sort of inside job. Somebody that works there knows mm -hmm. what this is worth, so they took it, type thing. If that were the case, they would have just made sure it didn't get scanned, My, because Only all the onus is on the company. All the onus is on the like it was scanned in at your place. You were the last people to see this guitar. It's your responsibility. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas if it never made it to, to there, it'd be much easier. But yeah, I'm not not. He's clearly emotional. You would be emotional if you'd you'd lost a guitar. Just me in that photo. Maybe I'm wrong. It looks like the first fret is almost fanned. Like it's just the way the guitar's sitting. Yeah, just the way you get you get me. Like it does look yeah. like that, doesn't it? I think the the forced perspective. Um, I think it's probably because of the it's the, the relicking on it as well has kind of uh, adds a, a an illusion of shadow. Um, aye, yeah, that's fair. That's fair. But, you know, nice looking Telecaster. As I, it's a it's meat and tatties. It's just yeah. absolutely basic, but it's good that it came back. Eight and a half grand. Yeah. It's worth. Probably worth more than that. That's probably what it's worth in terms of like parts. Yeah. 
yeah if you wanted to if you wanted to buy one of these from a custom shop from vendor that's what you'd pay but of course this one's owned by joe bonamassa so he could probably sell this for four times that <laughs> mm -hmm. um yeah like i say the guitar showed up so it's uh, i did want to um mention it uh because it's it is it nice to see is it nice to see people that have this level of influence can just have things done um to to go back to the pro piracy thing you know like i'm nobody in the grand scheme of things so when i make a, a fuss about something online not much really gets done about it whereas if misha and it wouldn't surprise me genuinely had an issue with these he could suddenly start tweeting about this and get a lot of people riled up it would be much much easier for him to find the right lawyer to do something about this than when an individual has a problem and in this bonamassa situation it's like you have all this power and influence to make change in the world in the guitar community uh, the music industry and the thing that's annoyed you more than anything is your guitar being misplaced for three fucking days <laughs> Well, oh, to be fair, it wasn't so much that it was misplaced for three days. For what I read there, they said something like it was missing accounted for with no recourse or actions uh, possible to recover it. was the comment that was yeah. left by FedEx to him. So no wonder he would go, sure. wait a fucking minute. You're basically saying I am up to shit creek. That is the worst thing, though, when it comes to shipping a guitar. I sold that, that Minus last week and it got got shipped out to, um, oh, so you did. to a chap in Ireland. And you shipping a guitar and getting insurance on it is next to impossible now yep no one will insure a, a yep. musical instrument and it's like cool so i just have to accept that in sending this <laughs> uh in sending this i i don't get any money like the, the, if if something goes wrong here i'm i'm fucked and i just have to fight with the guy that i've sold the guitar to over it um but the point is that wasn't something i found out when the guitar went missing, not that the guitar went missing, it was something that I had to click a box saying that I acknowledged, because when I said musical instrument, it said, we don't cover this. It's on know. the restricted list, yeah. so you send it at your own risk, and we yeah. won't ship it even if it doesn't have a hard case, Yeah, but we won't insure it even if it does have a hard case, yeah. even if it's a flight case, even if it's a t like a TSA yeah. fucking uh, spec one or whatever. Yeah. Aye, it's pish. It's totally pish. It's really, really quite annoying. Yeah, so Joe wouldn't, well, I would like to think that Joe wasn't, wouldn't have been surprised when that happened it's more of a like oh great that that thing that i agreed to is now going to bite me in the ass <laughs> uh, kind of i would get the impression that joe wasn't getting the cheapest four day delivery sure. from fedex that yeah. we would be getting yeah i think he's probably getting the priority and this is a very very valuable guitar make sure this is looked after and given the amount of amps and guitars he's got in the logistics yeah he must go under for tours and stuff sure there's every chance he's got like a client account and an account yeah. manager, whatever else. Well, actually, so... if this was going to Guitar World, they wouldn't have uh, wouldn't have even been dealing with it. Someone else would have uh, would have been dealing with it. Fucking deliveries, 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 deliveries. Real life goes on, mate. We we talk about it all the time. Real life just goes on. Yeah, it's a life lesson, and it's a life lesson that Joe Bonamassa's got to learn too. Yeah, real life happens, mate. Things get in the way. Ha ha! My parcel showed up. <laughs> <laughs> so it does. <laughs> just a bit late. Fair, fair. Um, <laughs> so. I will put it out there and say I am empathetic towards Joe because sure. uh, the fucking hassle that I had <laughs> yeah. with no one else's fault except fucking UPS um, with the dead world. Just, yeah. Just the jalities. Like, <laughs> don't be so fucking useless. But at the same time, I'm... all right. <sighs> it's all part and parcel, isn't it? Let's do this main story. So. Uh, the 1959 Gibson Les Paul Holy Grail is it? I thought 58 so more popular but okay 59 Gibson Les Paul is the Holy Grail of electric guitars and the company will pay big money to get its shipping ledgers back we've always been at war with East Asia what? quote in 1984 oh okay sorry you were saying the 58 but they yeah. said the 59 yeah quite honestly it's like whatever Gibson say people will go yes you're right oh 100% <laughs> so I'll give us a wee read. This came off Forbes, which is a very interesting article for doing music stuff, but yeah. it's probably way more towards the uh, the financial side than it is the business. Uh, Gibson Les Paul is practically synonymous with rock and roll becoming the go-to acts for countless guitar heroes, including Led Zeppelin's Jimmy Page, Aerosmith's Joe Perry, and Guns N' Roses Slash. It's as versatile an instrument as it is iconic, and the right hands can ring thunderous riffs, molten solos, and warm, clean tones from an equal measure. Vomit. See, when guitarists explain things, man, I hate it. The, the flowery language that we use. 
but it's even worse when it's a non-guitarist that explains it. <laughs> well, yeah, there is that. <laughs> uh, Gibson enjoyed its golden era between 1958 and 1960, and the 59 Les Paul standards are some of the most highly sought-after guitars in the world. They regularly fetch six-figure sums, as a well-preserved 59 Les Paul with a coveted flame maple top could easily command $500,000 or more. Mm. For decades, Gibson has been missing a crucial document from its golden era. It's 59 to 60 shipping ledgers, which are presumed to have gone missing around the time the company moved from Kalamazoo, Michigan, to Nashville, Tennessee in 1984. These ledgers contain information about every Gibson product shipped between the second half of 1958 and the end of 1960, including Flying Vs, Explorers, early SGs, and of course, the hallowed 59 Les Pauls. They may be able to shed light on lesser-known Gibson models and prototypes and further distinguish authentic 59 Les Pauls from the hordes of fakes. Now, Gibson is seeking to reclaim its history. The company is launching a nationwide search for its missing shipping ledgers and offering $59,000 with zero questions asked to anybody who can return the books. It's also offering rewards on a case-by-case basis for any documents, blueprints or historical assets predating 1970. Anybody who thinks they have a qualifying item can email 59ledger at gibson.com with a written description, photograph or video and phone number. I like the uh, with zero questions asked thing, like like people might have these documents through shady means. <laughs> I'm sorry, Gibson, these documents no longer exist. <laughs> I or anybody that's got them has taken them because you didn't pay enough attention and you've discarded them. But why would... Uh, can, so- can I take a wee step back even sure. further? Why are you offering $59,000 for books that's going to equate to maybe doubling the value of all the guitars for two years? It's not really... I don't even know if it will, will, will do anything to the value of the guitars. Having something that proves the authenticity <coughs> and the, the story of them? I would think so for a serious collector. Yeah, but not so, but not for Gibson. Doesn't really do anything for Gibson. Doesn't help Gibson in um, any way, shape, or form. Uh, to me, it's like it a kind of improves brand preservation of of legacy of the company. Like, maybe, maybe. But it must be annoying to have that one. You know, have everything well documented apart from this one area. Um, who's to blame? Gibson. Just, just bad organisation. Nah, like, just... No one's kept these documents. No one's gone. Ha. Huh. You know, no. in 1984, or whenever it was, when they moved shop, I doubt it. No, someone's like, "Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pocket that. That'll be." <laughs> Can you imagine heritage guitars had them? <laughs> <laughs> they probably are sat in there, <laughs> <laughs> cutting them up into tiny wee slivers and putting like one tiny bit of each page into the pickup uh, <laughs> cavity of every Les Paul they sell. Like, fuck you, Gibson, get it right up, yeah. They've been using it as packing material. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> We're running out of toilet paper again. Yeah. I just use the ledgers. They're good shit tickets anyway. <laughs> so uh, we're in search of the Holy Grail, says Gibson CMO Cesar Guaycan. Uh, one of the greatest incentives for recovering Gibson's missing shipping uh, ledgers is to have ironclad proof of authenticity of its golden era Les Pauls. The company only shipped 643 Les Pauls in 1959, but these days there are far more alleged 59 Les Pauls in circulation. Having these documents won't help with that, will it? Because if two of them have a match in serial, like it's not the legitimacy of a serial number that's the issue, and there's nothing on a document from from the, you know the 1959 that's going to help you to look at a guitar sixty odd years on mm-hmm. and go, yep, that's the that's definitely the one that we. Yep. How much detail do you think was in these shipping ledgers? It'd be different. comments on the grain of the wood. And- uh, that's <laughs> that, like see if it were something like the um, it wasn't so much a shipping ledger but like a uh, an index of these specific models yeah. and little telltale things about them. Sure. Maybe. Yeah. Like, obviously collectors and people who are enthusiasts to certain guitars get to know things about them, like certain eras had certain pots and certain wiring looms and they'd certain ways they'd shielded it. Yeah. And the caps were set thicknesses and they use a specific ebony that does this and sure. we know the finishes act in this way if they've been lo- not looked after or looked after and the headstock's right and they use this... Uh, inlay whatever um, or material for the inlay I know a lot of that sounds like it's just generic stuff and it probably is but my yeah. point is there's a lot of things that are time specific sure. um, and period specific if those were details that were on the ledgers fair enough people but it's not going to be yeah, people can get that. it's a shipping ledger I actually can think of one aspect where this might help which is if, if somebody was trying to sell a, a knockoff 59 Les Paul you imitate a 59 Les Paul you want to imitate all the details you talked about there. Mm-hmm. You want to have all the era correct stuff. You want it aged correctly. But what you want to go with it is documentation, mm-hmm. right? You want the serial number, but also receipts of purchase and mm-hmm. things like that. So if you've got a 59 Les Paul on the market with a uh, with a purchase receipt, a faked purchase receipt from buying the guitar you know, back in 59, 
And then Gibson can look at their shipping ledger and say, well, actually, this was shipped to Manny's Music. So if this guitar was legitimate, it would have been, you'd have a purchase receipt from Manny's Music, mm -hmm. not from the store that you that you have it from. Mm -hmm. That might be a way of disproving some, some fakes, but... The hard part would be to be a lot of stores that are shut since then. Yeah. And uh, many hands that could have traded through. So yeah. I, I, I kind of like that Gibson are trying to get that history back, yeah. but at the same time, I don't think it's quite as important as they think. Yeah. Um, well, I'm saying that the missing ledgers could also contain information even more tantalising and groundbreaking, or really, um, details about the mythical Gibson Modern. <laughs> Terrible guitar. <laughs> I know. The company prototyped the guitar in 1957 in tandem with the Flying V and Explorer, but did not put it into production until 1982. Patent drawings exist, but there is no physical evidence that Gibson ever created a Modern in the 50s. Billy Gibson's of, uh, sorry, Billy Gibson's, Billy Gibbons of ZZ Top has claimed to own an original, but has never allowed anyone to photograph or inspect it for authenticity. To this day, the modern remains the great white whale of the guitar world. Great white buffalo. You alright, son? Your phone seems to be going right hot today. I know. I know, it's because I put up that, that Misha post, uh, so my, my phone's been blown up um, with that, and that's Melissa coming home, so that's why So she, she wasn't in the house then? So I shouldn't get that. Ah, well, that's fair enough. <laughs> um, uh, uh, let's take that. Um, let's be honest though look at it it's fucking uh. yeah. so I mean um, I can't be bothered to read through this whole whole story yeah. it's, and, and uh, it's good journalism it's interesting journalism and of course it is it's on Forbes not an ultimate guitar so I would encourage people to head on over to Forbes and have a look at this story it's dated uh, July 14th uh, the Gibson 59 Les Paul is the holy grail of electric guitars and the company will pay big money to get it shipping their just back actually we, we should probably definitely check this out because it was for last year so it's more, nearly a year old July that, 14th 2020 that is that is absolutely true I mean I should point out I didn't find this on a news story was it this was sent to me by one of my one of my students I am the I worst the for checking like, dates yeah. and stuff we've but done it, that a few times we went to read things it was like oh that's 2015 <laughs> <laughs> yeah well I wonder if there's been any update can you google and see Gibson shipping ledgers. Let's have a look. Did uh, Gibson get the shipping ledgers for 59? Let's have a look. Ah, so we can always turn this into something else, isn't it? Gibson ledgers. No, it looks like they're still offering it. Yeah, I, I'll, it's one of those things, isn't it? Like, all the stories are, are from back then, and it's it's very much a case of... Is that photos of, like, similar shipping ledgers? Because then we can actually work out what it is it says on them. Oh, they're fucking handwritten, man. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. From from that era. I know. Well, saying that, the serial numbers are stamped, are they not? It looks like they've been stamped in. And uh, I like... Yeah, they'll use the same stamp that stamped it in the headstock, and yeah. But uh, let's be totally honest, like, how, what's that proven? Yeah. Hon honestly, to me, uh, it's preservation, isn't it? Like, knowing... I'd be really annoyed. It's like... So you're a magazine collector. I was a magazine collector. Guitar Techniques magazine. If I if there was oh, one issue that was missing from the middle of it, you know that would burn in my mind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but just <laughs> drive me absolutely insane. So, Seeding in your soul. Exactly. So um, oh, well. yeah, I can see uh, that. Well, thanks Kevin for sending me that and not telling me it wasn't a new story. <laughs> But it is very much still, a, I mean, so much so that I wanted to make it a main story because the idea of something like that, and maybe someone's listening to this podcast, didn't see that and go, huh, I think I have those. If you do, we will split that 59 grand with you. That would be... I think uh, Lance Benedict's probably got them. Yeah, is that how he designed all of his guitars? Must have been. The, yeah, well, makes makes total sense. He's, um, I hear he's going to make a, an appearance in something that we're working on. Possibly. Something, something soon. Which Possibly. Is, uh, we will have plenty more to tell you about that, though, as the coming weeks um, happen. Uh, we've got lots of things to tell you. For example, did you know this show is brought to you by our friends over at Ormsby Guitars? And I want to let you guys know that now is the time to get involved on their upcoming Run 16 guitars. Now, there's some incredible guitars here available for your money, starting as low as $1,400. That is an incredible price for some cutting edge guitar technology. Starting up first, we have the Run 16 Hype GTRs, available in a variety of colours, 6, 7 and 8 string models. You can also get your hands on a Metal X, again in a variety of colours and different string variations. You can also purchase the Metal V Headless, which is my choice of the bunch. Absolutely stunning, especially in that Dragon Burst. Absolutely beautiful instrument, super cool. Imagine that in an 8 string, you know you want it. And then finally, we have the Hype 6 GTR Ando San Signature Model. Again, another Hype GTR available in 6, 7 and 8 string models. 
This show is also brought to you by our friends over at Rev Amplification, a one-stop shop for all the best tones that you could ever desire. Head on over to Rev's website to check out their incredible range of lunchbox amplifiers, the D20 and G20. Both 20 watt lunchbox amplifiers equipped with two notes, torpedo embedded reactive load and virtual cabinets so you can both play live and record direct into your home recording system. All that tube tone with none of the hassle. If you're looking for all of that classic Rev tone but on a budget then check out their pedal series. The G2, G3 and G4 pedals will give you the classic Rev Generator 120 amp tones but in a stomp box. I use one of these myself on a regular basis and the tone is astonishing. Alternatively, you can head on over to their amplifier section and check out the Generator 120, the big daddy of amplifiers. You may notice one in the back of these Guitar Souls videos. You will get no better tone in a big monster amp than this. Thanks very much to the guys at Rev. On with the show. So as always, a huge thanks to our friends and family over at Ormsby Guitars and an extra special thank you to our new friends and family over at Rev Amplification. Please do go and check those guys out. Match made in heaven. Let's just be honest. Yeah. Well, I mean, talking about a match made in heaven, I, I'm under the impression that there's going to be a literal match made in heaven because your, your uh, upcoming Rev mm -hmm. G20 amplifier mm -hmm. looks a lot like your, your Ormsby 7-string SX. Yeah. it's seven almost string. like the asses what finish we wanted and I said, I'll take a seafoam green one if it's yeah. going. And they went, <laughs> sound. So yeah. I'm going to have an amp head that matches my guitar and it's going to look pimp. It's going to look garish as fuck and I cannot wait. Same. Can, yeah, same. <laughs> um, so yeah, big, right up my street. Big big thanks to those guys. Um, Mike thinks that he's hopefully going to get his hands on a on a headless V from Ormsby, and maybe hopefully at some point soon I can tell you what this new secret guitar Ormsby are working on, and if I can confirm that I can get my hands on one of them. I tell you what I want the yeah. Ormsby PC two, Perry, I'm telling you. What's oh a party a party cannon? No, no, okay. Perry's choice. Oh, okay, but yeah, I guess that makes sense. So I don't know if anybody knows about this, but Perry's been building his own yes projects, basically going. This is my choice, hence Perry's choice. Yeah. Um, and there's a few very nice ones. Number two is especially especially luring. I don't know how much Perry's put into the wild, um, or if it's for somebody. I know it was originally for somebody, sure. and what's happened. I don't know what's happening with it, but oh, aye. oh, aye. <laughs> oh, aye. yeah. So um, yeah. What you know what Perry could do that would be nice? Like a, a custom builder. Like Mayonnaise have got or who else has good custom builders online? Honestly, I've got a custom builder online. Do they like a graphical one? Aye. This is absolutely new. Are you joking? Me. Yeah, no, this is absolutely I've new. I've fucked to me. about with it hundreds of times. So great. Ormsy have got one. Rev have got one. If you guys could send us some fan mail with your custom designed Ormsby's and your custom designed Revs, mm -hmm. uh, we'll share some on the on the show next week. If if you want to take it even further, you could mock up some fake, whether they be, you think they would be really good or really stupid and funny, mock signature guitars for Levi and I and amplifiers for Levi and I and see what you think. Because I'd, I'd imagine they will like vary wildly yeah. in, a, <laughs> in design. Yeah. Um, sweet. So again, thank you to Ormsby. Thank you to Rev. You guys are absolutely awesome. And you guys listening to the podcast are absolutely awesome too. Please do get involved on buymeacoffee.com. Link in the description. Great way to support the show. Get some bonus content and all that good stuff. And keep your eyes peeled for our announcement of our upcoming uh, one. Oh, it's not a one-off because we probably will never stop selling the shirt because it's such a cool design that I've been working on for this. Um, uh, yeah, but if you buy it during the limited period, you will be able to get your name in the intro to the show. You can be immortalised in Guitar Souls lore, which should uh, be good fun. Any uh, any messages, closing messages for the lovely people watching? As usual, thanks very much for checking us out. Um, special thanks to anyone who's been at the Monday Night Guitar Geek Club um, once or every week. I know we've got some very uh, persistent fans, which is lovely. The people regulars. That, yeah, consistent. It's great. Um, always good to have a good chat with you. Um, I should be there tonight. I don't see any reason. So I should be there right now. Uh, <laughs> I don't see any reason why I wouldn't be unless no, I end up just going doing dishes. It's half two in the again. afternoon. I've still got to get this thing fucking edited, rendered, uploaded, and mm -hmm. you know it's going to be a tight one. <laughs> I'll take you two minutes, and you yeah, know what? I'll be fine. Um, yes. So thanks very much. If you haven't done it already, please have you like. Make sure that you are subscribed to the channel and you're following us. And you've got notifications on, obviously on Levi's channel, so you can catch up with the guitar souls every week. Um, looking forward to doing another bonus episode. We haven't had any suggestions for another bonus episode I think yet. We'll have do we? more of the same. 
Want to do more guitar riffs? Yeah. Because I'm going to pick out some really horrible ones, and I'm talking like it, you were talking about in well, that horrible technical tappy things and yeah. No, I'm talking. No, that's fine because that's stuff that you will be able to get. I know, but the be the be is, is it's the position change discussion. stuff that I know you hate. It's a, yeah, but the thing for people that haven't seen that bonus episode, the thing I think is so great about it is talking about the approach to learning things like that mm-hmm. and taking something that is within my wheelhouse, but also a metric mile away from the comfort zone, it's interesting to talk about how you go about learning stuff like that. So, uh-huh. Yeah. Cool. No, I'll, 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 like we'll find some other ones yeah. or I can let you pick some riffs or even if anyone out there wants to suggest a riff that I have to teach Levi from the party canon lore, <laughs> for, if there's anyone there that, that likes party canon, can listen to it and decide for it, please fire your suggestions ahead. It'd be good. Fantastic. I told you that we got the final mix back, didn't I? Yes. Oh. Yeah. Oh. I can't oh, wait for people to hear it. Big heavy. I can't wait for me to avoid it. Big heavy. <laughs> I, I hope you know that the first episode of Can Metal Have Soul. I mean, people don't know about that yet. So. Just black mute, it's all right. Yeah. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the first episode, I've told you. Um, actually, the plan for that is I'm going to go year by year, starting from like, it. like early, like Sabbath potentially. That's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. But I felt I'd said too much already. Yeah. So. Um, going to be lots of fun but yeah, again more announcements that will come I don't want to say anymore so I'm going to shut up Mike until next time stay hydrated